Good evening and welcome to the November and December meeting of the Lower Makefield Township Historical Commission. We have three um, members beside myself here and our supervisor liaison, Fred Weiss. James Nice, who is new to the commission. Welcome, James. We're all happy to have you and excited to see what you can bring. Um, we have Eric Rockenbush and we have Joe Camarada. Thank you all for coming. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Um, our, our Zoom agenda, I actually have up on another computer. So um, the, the minutes from October, our first order of business, does anyone want to make a motion to approve the minutes? I had no changes, I'd make a motion to approve. You have some changes, Joe? No, I, no, I have no changes, I would make a, a, a motion to approve. Okay, Th thank you, Joe. Second? I'll second, Barbara, or Helen, sorry. Thank you, Eric. Okay, uh, all in favor? I, I think that's, we have a quorum, so that's that's awesome. Thank you for voting on that, Eric. Did you get it? I mean, thank you, James. Did you get a chance to read those? Yeah, I got both of the emails with the agenda for today and for the uh, the minutes. We're facing a number of issues, and the, um, the quarantine has certainly put a damper in any kind of activities that we would hope to do, um, but we're doing our part wherever we can. Um, I'm not sure, Joe, whether the resolution of what's in our community funds and what's in our um, budget for next year has been resolved. So I was going to pass that over to you and maybe you could discuss it with Fred, how we can resolve what we have and what is planned for next year. So what is the confusion? I mean, the budget we had this year was for 500 and that was, the, Fred confirmed, that was the budget going into next year also, correct, Fred? Right. Correct. So it seems like there's confusion over the community fund and not the minutes from last time said there was $4,000. Do we not have a, a, an exact total? Uh, I don't know what um, the exact total is. Uh, we must have it somewhere. And uh, I know staff is working on it presently and we'll probably get a, a more exact number soon. Should I, should I, with whom should I follow up? Uh, with Tasha Manager, Kirk. Okay, I'll follow up with Kirk on the exact number that's in there. Thank you, Joe. I really appreciate if you take care of that. I did take down everything I got from Krista and put it in their outbox, so they should know these were funds, James, that we we have raised in the last two, well, basically four or five years now, um, from doing cemetery tours, which are a silly little thing that we did to try to promote Slate Hill Cemetery. And we had a reenactress show up and we charged like, well, actually we charged no admission, but we asked for a donation of $5 for people to come in and hear about the Slate Hill Cemetery and usually right around Halloween. So it would be a good family activity. And um, it's always gone over really well. And we were planning on doing it again next year with a sort of focus on the Civil War since we just had the six soldiers um, would get their tombstones. So we would probably follow up with more of the other, there's there's 20 altogether in our cemetery between the two sections of the cemetery. There's a, what they call the segregated section, which is um, traditionally was where the black congregation is in Yardley buried and also Methodists and also some Presbyterians. And then there was a old, old Quaker section that's the original from where William Yardley is supposedly placed. And that has almost no markers because the Quakers didn't mark the grave. So it's hard, it looks like it's empty and there's nothing there, but there's actually, that's where the original settlers would be. And then there's the second section that was given to the town, uh, given to the falls meeting in around 1720. And that the Quakers, because it was so far from Fallsington and it was the falls meeting, they allowed strangers to be buried there as well as Quakers. So there's Quakers, but there's also Presbyterians and there's even a small Catholic section has got um, kind of piping around it. So, I mean, basically it, almost any congregation that wanted to, that didn't want to be in the public graveyard buried there. Now the public graveyard was apparently always given to Lower Makefield Township and we were not really aware of it until 1992 when we got the cemetery placed on the National Register and quite an effort from the, this commission to do that and get it. They don't usually put 
cemeteries on the National Register. And one of the main reasons they agreed to do it was not only the Quaker Cemetery, but the fact that we had the oldest known tombstone in Bucks County, obviously a non-Quaker um, from 1698. And we also had, at that point, we had about 15 Civil War soldiers. We didn't know about the others. And now we have 20. So various research has, has brought that out. So it's really kind of interesting that that should happen as well. Okay, so if you guys are looking um, on the agenda, the next item on the agenda was the um, development plans. One of our main purposes, James, um, is to, re to review plans that come into the township. And in years past, they've been pretty good about passing on to us various plans that come in and asking us for comment. Um, we have no legal um, sway over what happens in the township. We're here as an advisory board to the supervisors to inform them of anything that could be of potential interest um, to local history, to, to county history, to state history, and if possible, national history. But, um, and there, believe it or not, there are some things that do get to that level, but usually it's local history and people wanting to put additions on old houses or people wanting to demolish old houses. And so we often come up with um, kind of a negative impact because we're saying things like, please don't demolish the old house. And um, they, all, they all get upset with us, but <clears throat> that's okay, I'll take it. Um, currently, there's a number of plans in that, that are affecting historic houses. And the major one is the cricket development. So that is, did you get a chance to take a look at that? Yeah, I've kept up with that. Yeah, you, you know, that's a, going to be a, a big um, a Wegmans and then a series of, of apartment buildings. Um, and they're, they're saying that they're going to preserve the historic house and barn. Um, they are not interested in the other structures. So we're probably going to lose them, but we're going to ask when it comes to the supervisors if they could at least retain the stone somewhere, if maybe the township would be, would be um, thinking about stacking it somewhere, because we always need stone and we're going to need stone for Slate Hill Cemetery on an ongoing basis to repair walls, et cetera. And there's always use for that. So possibly we're gonna ask if they are demolishing anything that any stone be salvaged out of that for the township's use. Um, it, one of the concerns with the Prickett development is the proximity of some of the interior roads to the old house, which is um, probably built around 1740 from what I can figure. It could be earlier and I've never been in it. So I really don't know how old it is. Um, even when you go in it, sometimes you can't tell because they, people have cemented the floors and covered things up. But if, you, if you've got a good eye, you can kind of see. And I know it was owned by the Janney family from, from the, the William Penn Grant. And there were at least, six adult male Jannies that were on that farm. So not all of them were living in one house. And um, presumably Abel Janney, who became a provincial counselor around 1720, built his own house. He, was, he would have been commuting to New Town almost every day because he was, a, he was a provincial counselor. So he would have been going to New Town. He was a judge, a local judge. Um, presumably he would have a fairly large house. That house, could be able Jamie's house, um, but, but there's no way to prove it unless you get some historical and archeological um, feedback. We did contact SHPO, the State Historic Preser Preservation Office about this house and barn because it was on our list. We have a kind of um, an early warning list that was done in 1980 by the Heritage Conservancy um, when it was called something else, but Jeff Marshall, who's still head of this Heritage Conservancy, and Kathy Ann Auerbach went around the township with a, I think it was a Carter grant at the time, or it might have been a Reagan grant, but anyway, um, and assessed preliminarily houses in Bucks County that were potential for National Register nomination. And this house did rise to that level. They looked at it and they thought that this was a significant property. Um, and so they put that on, this house on that list. We revised that list for our township in 1996. And it's due for revision again, because a lot of these structures have disappeared or been altered beyond recognition and they need to be noted. Um, 
But anyway, at this point, the, the list of houses, um, it's on it. So we, it, Ship Oaks was triggered. They came out and they did request that the developer do a stage one archeological assessment. That means basically they're gonna be digging about six pits and looking for things. There could be prehistory, there could be um, stuff from the early 18th century. Um, the house was clearly there by the time Washington came along um, and he did pass through Lower Makefield coming over from Trenton at the, at the ferry, which would have been right about Ferry Road and then probably going up Stony Hill Road to Lindenhurst to points north to get to where he ultimately crossed. Where he stationed his various units, there is no knowledge of that. And various historians, there's, there's at least six who have written books on the crossing who have placed various units of the cavalry and the artillery and the, the, the men at various places along that route from Route 1, the King's Highway, to 532. Um, I kind of suspect just from finding local artifacts and being here 35 years, I've seen quite a few. And one of my kids actually found a 12 pound cannonball in our, in our subdivision next door as it was going through. And so I seriously suspect that the artillery and, and the cavalry was in Lower Makefield. So, because it would have been logical that Washington would have wanted to place them in a, in a site where they could easily access the roads to Philadelphia should the British cross and follow him into Pennsylvania. And he would want them to be near to access roads to the West. Um, so both the Newtown Road and Langhorn Road, it makes sense to me that this property that's so critical to both those roads would be a spot where he would definitely have soldiers and artillery. And so I, I'm curious to find out what they find. I think it would be awesome. We, there is no, at this point, there is no diary from Montgomery or anybody who was in the cavalry that will let us know where they actually stayed, you know, what family. <clears throat> there were, at that point on the farm, the Brown family and Brown family were associators. So they were in the local militia. They were all, most young men. Sadly, one of the young Brown sons, Benjamin, joined the British army. So we actually have in that one family split over the revolution and certain members that actually joined the British army went off, he was disowned by the family. And later after his father died, um, his brothers did give him a portion. He was then living in Nova Scotia because anyone who joined the British army basically got their pay in, in Nova Scotia land, which can't have been such a great thing. So anyway, he did find his way back to Lower Makefield and there was some reconciliation, but it is an interesting kind of fact that um, the revolution was not everybody joined. It was definitely uh, uh, something that people split. <clears throat> so anyway, um, Jim had said something about us walking the site. I have tried a couple of times to get in touch with him. I will try again. Um, I know he and the engineer walked the site. Um, with the SHPO representative, but I have not heard um, him scheduling us to get on. He said that we could. So Fred, if you would kind of put a word in with Jim, that would be awesome. Yeah, he uh, he just got through doing it with the planning commission. Okay. So um, if you just, if you keep calling him, okay. sure, or, or you, if you send him an email and you copy me, I'll make sure that you got anybody who wants to walk the property can. Okay. With or without the developer. Yeah, okay, that would be great, Fred, because I'll, I'll set that up then and hopefully sometime next week. Um, so, Helen, for the buildings that won't be retained, could we, do you think we can get a commitment that they're appropriately documented and photographed and things like that so we don't you know, lose any information from, from historical purposes? It depends on the developer. Um, I'll ask. I'll definitely put that on my list to ask. He's been very... From what I can tell, he's been very cooperative. I don't think you know a, a request like that would be out of the, you know, out of bounds. Also, it, could, it, it can be quite expensive, especially. I know Jeff Marshall used to do it. I'm um, personally, he would come in with a video camera, and um, before they I'm took sure, that, yeah. I'm you know. sure there's a good way to do it. And also, if you know the stones for the foundations of the outbuildings, um, we might want to request that they use them in the new construction as well. 
Yeah, where they can, but I, I my my sense is they really don't want to maybe as pavings or something like that. But my sense is that they really want to clear the site so that they can build faster. I'm, I'm just going to ask that they not be put in the landfill. Please don't don't put them in the landfill. So stone recycled, um, given to township. We're, I know we're always looking for it. Um, <clears throat> um, well, it's definitely something you you and Jim Majewski can discuss when you talk to him, when you walk the, uh, and I, you walk the site. I was asking Greg too a while ago for stones because I know the wall at Satterthwaite House needs to be repaired. Um, the, the school, the, the Slate Hill Cemetery wall against the Pico station definitely needs a repair. And we've already been documented with Jim that the stucco needs to come off the Slate Hill wall cemetery second section and get repointed. So at that point, we were looking for stones. We were trying to fill in that um, gap in the wall when the tree came down and Greg had nothing. And he said, you know, Helen, you should get me something. Um, my husband was dealing with um, Delaware River quarries with the, with his, um, was the president of the AIA locally. And mm -hmm. he went up and he actually asked the guy, um, would you be willing to donate stone? And he said, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I told Greg, but they never took advantage of it. They would require the township sending a truck off to Delaware River Quarry, but he said they're always willing to donate extra cut stone. And um, and Greg said, oh, it's too expensive. I can't get it. So, I mean, I think there are people who are willing to give it to us if we ask properly. So there's Barbara. Hello, Barbara. Hi, how you doing? Sorry I'm late. That's okay. So we're talking about cricket. Um, The, the communications issue with the township is really a problem, Fred, but you know, I, do you have any sense of when we can get back to meeting and then talk to Jim and, and the township manager? No. You, th that's quite honest. When, when, when you know, the, the situation with COVID is such that we can't look at in-person meetings for quite some time. Now, once, once people are vaccinated, that's a different story. Okay. Thank God, it looks like there's two vaccines that are coming out uh, in the next, you know, month or so. So maybe by late spring, early summer, we'll be all together again. Okay, because um, I think this commission is definitely suffering from the poor communication on, on, on what do you think, Barbara? Uh, the problem is for me, I agree, because I like to have consistency in a certain time and I plan for it. Sometimes when it changes, it, it's nothing with you, but like today, a meeting came up and if I had to be in person and be there at seven o'clock on the second, I would never even have scheduled a meeting. So I, I agree, but we can do the best we can. And I know that's what we had a meeting about. We might have to even shut the, the, the program because of, of the, you know, the fluid nature of the situation. So I agree with Fred. We can't really open up until we're sure. Okay. Yeah, just just keep, you know, if you can call Jim or Kurt. Um, I mean, if you send me an email, I will go and uh, discuss it with them. Uh, you, know, you have to understand, there's, we don't have much of a staff anymore. Really? You know, well, we never had much of a staff, actually. But uh, everybody's works from home now. Uh, you know, we had one member of the the uh, uh, Park and Rec Department pass away. Another one got married, moved away. Uh, we have we have uh, you know office assistants that um, are in the high risk category, as we all are, except for maybe James. And uh, uh, you know, it's just it's it's. COVID has given us some challenges that are very difficult to really work through. Uh, you know, uh, my son is still uh, is still waiting from the state to get uh, his certification for a clinical license for social work, and uh, they they just stopped the um, the deadlines because there's not enough staff to process applications. So it's 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 a very difficult situation. Uh, it is, uh, and um, I know with, with grants and, and funding, it's going to be an issue, but we really do have to push forward as much as we possibly can. 
Well, if you have a, like I said, copy me on any correspondence, and I will, um, I will do my bit. You want to hear some good news about Mr. Wieners and the octagonal schoolhouse? No. Sure. Yes. He turned to be. He turns out to be my buddy. He, well, you've he, been calling him every month. I've been calling him every month, and he's been like just saying okay or I'll call you, and he never really talks or doesn't. So last month he decided to call me and give me the to do. This is off the record. Okay. He decided to give me the to do, and I just said to him, "Look, I'm relatively new," and I said, "And." And I named all of you. I said, Eric and Fred and Joe and Helen and, you know, uh, Becky. I said, we're relatively new. So if you have any ax to grind with these old people, the good news is I don't even know who they are, but I did know a lot of them. I said, but I, I don't know who, even who they are. I said, but let's move forward. I said, here's what I want to do. I want to get a plaque that says your name on it, his wife's name, and that you gave us the property. He says, well, I'm paying taxes or whatever. I said, don't give me any story about taxes. I said, it's minimal. He said that then he went back eight or 10 years ago of what he really did offer to the township and how the, the regime 10 years ago turned him down, how, how the CVS, excuse me, CVS pharmacy was willing to purchase that corner and the township put a blocker in it. So really, we came out smelling like dead roses. So dead roses. I really <laughs> felt that after I spoke to this guy, I think that I promised him that I would call him and bring it up to you and tell you what I, he is up in years, I could tell. He lives in Florida. His father passed away, who was the, I guess, the owner of the property. And uh, he just feels that he got a bum deal from all the people that he named and I knew. And he said that basically uh, he is willing to look into this and, and have it. And I said to him, you know, there's a couple properties. And he said, well, you know, I had all the bricks there. And, I, and he said, but one by one, there's a man in our township who, has, who literally goes there once every couple of weeks and takes bricks from there. And literally yeah. had the nerve to email him and rub it in his face. So something's going on that I'm going to play the detective and find out what's going on. But he is like, he is so far now willing to look into the fact that maybe the historical commission can do something with this piece of property, if nothing else, but putting a plaque and naming him, donating the property and putting a picture of what the schoolhouse looked like. And so, you know, he, he went from a, like a cantankerous old man to like, he's now my buddy. I knew so, you were the right person to talk to him. So, but, we, but it's still, I felt badly because I think Fred, if you could look into this maybe just to see if the ax he's grinding is really true. Um, Not yeah, true, I, but it has some I'm foundation. sure I can hear 20 different stories from 30 different- I know, different, but, the, yeah. but the thing is, the only thing I would want to know is number one, did he ever approach the township, I would say eight to 10 years ago before the CVS was built and was willing to turn over the property to, uh, to the township for a fair market value, not the, it was a dead property, like it was just a piece of land. Cool. That would be something that I would be interested in knowing because yeah. he seems to think that that was on the table and we could find that out. Well, Kristen, Tyler, Kristen had been dealing with it, Fred. And I know she wrote some letters and got some letters back, but she didn't really share with us where it was left. So maybe you could touch base with her. It froze up. It would just be interesting, even if we f find out that he's wrong, it would be interesting to do a professional statement that we looked into it. And this is what we at this present 2020 has found now, because the gentleman was really like, the word nasty would be like, like mild and then after i let him vent for like 30 minutes 35 minutes on speakerphone so my mother who was 101 could hear this when i hung up i said i hope you're never going to be like him she said he's too young i'll be you know so anyway but he was really but then i calmed him down and he's willing to hear i think he wants to just validate the fact that his father did have the property 
His father was a good person, worked a lot in the township and got a bum rap because they wanted to quote, take it away from him. And I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, it is. It is a question. Um, I actually. It, it's so interesting that you're talking about this. I, I didn't have it on actually until later. But <clears throat> and I, I I had written two agendas and I had it on one. I guess I took it off. But but anyway. Um, over the last month, I've been. You know, we were talking last month about the fact that the second grade across the board in Pensbury and the fourth grade in Pensbury are all studying. Pennsylvania history, and I've had a bunch of scout groups come up and ask me about local history because what's online is so horrible. And um, I actually did put together a finally a, um, a 45 slide <clears throat> presentation on local history, which is way too long for fourth graders. But anyway, in the course of it, I showed them pictures of old houses and said, you know, how old they were and how they went back to Washington and that kind of thing. And then I, I did put on the octagonal schoolhouse picture that I have and the plan and et cetera. And that absolutely lit up the room. The kids were so excited about that octagonal schoolhouse and um, the potential of, of doing something there and maybe doing some, you know, they were thinking silver projects in the future. These are fourth grade girls. So they're, I guess, 10, 11 years old. Um, it was it was really interesting, and then I, the same thing happened with Boy Scouts. I showed them the same presentation, and they absolutely loved the idea that in the middle of the American Revolution, this young Quaker boy was talking about schools that would join together as a public school for all the townships involved: Falls, Middletown, and Lower Makefield, and build it at the intersection of all three townships. And he was using a design out of his landscape architecture book. From Haverford College. So it was just so cool that it was, it, if James doesn't know, it's the prototype for, for all the octagonal schoolhouse. It was done by Manny Moses Moon. And um, as I said, he was an 18 year old, just fresh out of the, the college level at that point. You were 18 when you graduated from college. So he just graduated from Harvard. He really didn't have to work. His family was already making money in the nursery business. And um, he was a surveyor, he was trained as a surveyor. But so some of his surveys still exist up at the Bucks County Historical Society, but he basically surveyed this whole property. And on the paper with the survey, he has the design for the property and he has a list of all the people that paid to contribute to building it. It ended up being about 220 pounds to build this, this structure. And so that he has who built the, who put in the plaster and who put in the stone and who put in the scantling. And, it's awesome. I mean, it's such a cool little document. Um, and it's been published a couple of times locally in, in um, both the Bucks County Historical Society journals and in other journals. Uh, Craig Corley, who's the director of preservation for the state of New Jersey, got his master's based on that structure. Um, so it really is kind of a neat thing. And I've had talks with Steve Sanacero probably for the last 20 years now about how that is property of statewide you know, importance. And that's the reason why the, the turn from Oxford Valley Road to the west at the Coles is, is so narrow, it's only two lanes going west. Um, that's because it would hit the octagonal schoolhouse if they widened the road. It's right there. It's literally six feet from the edge of the, of the road. The lot is an unbuildable lot. It's in the right of way. Um, He's been paying about $70 a year in taxes. And I talked to Becky, she said he actually shouldn't be paying anything in taxes because it is an unbuildable lot. Um, but um, I know the discussion with Chris and Fred was that we would pay all the back taxes that they had paid over the last say 10 years and ask them for the donation of, of, the, of the piece of land, it's about a quarter of an acre. And it goes all the way back to Regency. And it's got a frontage on old Oxford Valley Road. And uh, we've talked, I, I've been there with, a couple of times now with um, various people from Public Works, et cetera. And it's actually below the grade of Oxford Valley Road. So it's actually quite quiet. And it would be a nice little place to put a pavilion if we could acquire it as part of our open space. So I know we don't have any money, but that is, that is my dream. And I know we could get the kids involved to either rebuild it. The stones are still there. 
It just all pushed into the center of the structure. So we could get, and we have a design. We could get it rebuilt. We can get grants from the state. I know Steve Sanicero would help us. Just saying. Right, but Thank the stone, but, but I think the stones, I went over to look at it. Uh, I think that he's right on the mark. Whoever this man, he wouldn't tell me who he was, but the next time I talk to him, I, I'm gonna say, you have to give me a name. You can't just say somebody. And uh, you know, if there is somebody in the township who is gathering these stones and removing them, uh, that too is to me a concern. Uh, but it's a, it's, I think it's a lot. I told him that I said, right now, it looks like a dump. I said, so if you know, if you're interested in your father's legacy, you got to do something about it. Because right now it's a dump and nobody even wants it. Because he was saying we should pay. Uh, they didn't even offer to pay me anything. And you know, I, I don't know if that's true or not. But if that's true, that eight years ago, nine years ago, 10 years ago, he really wanted to do something as a historical property and was in conjunction with the uh, our society years ago and also the other group, then we need to like just say to him, yes, we did know about it. No, we did not know about it. Let's move forward. Because I think the man is now willing to do something for it, which is better than a year. I tried a year. Every month this man got a phone call on the 15th. It's almost like tax season. The 15th of the month or 16th, I would call him, leave a message, say hello, hope he was fine. And this was the first time that he had a lengthy conversation with me. And it was a year ago. That's awesome, Barbara. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I hope it would work out. Well, we're going to have to put your name on it too if we get, if we get a- No, I don't want any of my name. My name is too popular. I don't want anything. I'm, I'm under the radar anymore. <laughs> you and me both. Um, yeah, okay, so, so Fred, just so you know, that's in the, 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 the air. And I don't know how you'd feel about it, but I think it's really worthwhile. It's something that would get children back involved in history, which I find really important. Uh, we've been discussing this for a long time. A year um, and a half. If, if, we could, if we could get, if Helen, you know, if, if the commission agrees to this, um, Helen, you, why, why don't you get pride or pride to Kristen to give you some history. And um, once you get some, some, a little bit of the history, you, you can give it to me and I'll get the township staff to uh, find out what the exactly the story is. And, and start, well, the, if, when the, if the board agrees to it, uh, we'll figure out a way to get that land and yeah. um, do proper dedications. Uh, no, nobody would be against uh, proper dedication to the current owners, and uh, and then of course some kind of uh, memorialization of the schoolhouse. Since I'm sure there's not enough stones to rebuild the schoolhouse, but uh, at least you know, like we said before, maybe put the foundation. I'm in. hopeful. I'm hopeful. I'm you know, really there's, hopeful. There's there's things there's things that can be done in the not too distant future, but um, the first thing we would have to do is acquire the, that property. Absolutely. And uh, and and and. Um, soothe over the years of what Barbara said was the owner's aggravation with the township. So we can take care of that. Okay, so, so you realize what, what happened was they, they widened Oxford Valley Road through his back cow pasture. The, the old Oxford Valley Road was the frontage to his house. Oh, I understand. This was on the corner. So, and I, and I gathered that, that he got less than 60,000 an acre. So that's why he was upset for his land. So, but back it was in the '60s, so that would have been appropriate. Or non, non, um, uh, no structures on the land we, that would have been appropriate. We can't change the past, but we can no. alter the future. Yes, so. thank you, Fred. Mm -hmm. That'd be awesome. All right. Um, the next item was the was the uh, plan on Mill Road. There's an old house on Mill Road, and this uh, this was brought into the township, um, I guess, to the zoning. No planning commission first, and and the planning commission said that they needed to. Or he was trying; they were trying to get a preliminary final, and they there were some issues that had to do with steep slopes. Um, he wanted to just demolish the old house, and we had made a comment at that first meeting that it was an old house. It was on our list uh, both in 1980 and in 1996. I had Jim check, and he found it was on the list. 
Uh, so, so it was identified by Jeff and Kathy Ann. It's not a particularly large, nice structure. In fact, in my slideshow, I use it as an example of a, of a tiny little house that would have been an original cabin. This is really not much more than a single room and an attic. <clears throat> so it's not a grand structure by any stretch of the imagination. But somebody with creativity could find a way to utilize it in a new, more modern structure. And this guy has no interest in doing that. He wants to put a big circular driveway in, a million dollar house on the back and just rip it out. So again, as it makes its way through various plantings, it's going to end up in front of you, Fred. I just hope that if you decide that you're going to give him the leeway to do this, and it's, there's going to be a lot of issues because the land was originally, um, Malin Paxson was a miller. So what I can see is there probably was a spring up by the, um, where the girls softball fields are and the spring fed a pond that then his driveway was the mill race for the pond. And it went down across Mill Road and down to the creek and then and probably another pond that fed another mill, Derbyshire's mill was down along the creek. And that was a whole series of mills down along Brock Creek there. So all fed from that steep hill draining the water, which is what the problem is now. The hill is steep and there's gonna be a lot of drainage from his property onto Mill Road and the neighbors across the street. So they're all looking at this with, oh, you know, what's this man trying to do? Um, so if he comes before you on the, at, at the supervisor's meeting, you know, I would encourage you to do what you can to preserve the old house and have him use it, incorporate it into at least his garage or something that would be useful um, so that some other person later could possibly uh, utilize it for, for a purpose that would be more suitable for an old house. And if not, again, we want documentation and we want the stones at least preserved. So that is the kind of end point where we're going to be for most of these old houses that have come down. And that one, so it is, since it is so early and so much of the early structure is missing, it should be documented, it really should. And I'm pretty sure this guy's not gonna to be too positive about doing that. If and, if and when it comes up, before, if and when it comes up before the board, Ellen, that this is why your eloquence will be important to present before the board to uh, advocate for that position. Or unless somebody else wants to take this on, that would be good. One of you guys. You do it so well, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> right. the, the third one after that was, um, um, oh, I, I had written, I'd written it on the agenda because uh, I was concerned that Barbara didn't mention it. And I actually emailed John Lewis at the meeting and said, John, say something about the old house. And he didn't say anything either. So it was very discouraging Fred, that some of your supervisors are not, do not seem to care about historic properties, you know, when we do tell them. Um, so he suggested I meet him meeting at a uh, comment at the next meeting since they didn't vote on anything as a final. Um, he's got a lot of work to do. So maybe he'll yeah, I mean, it's, his plans are not quite what township code is anyway. So yeah. it's going to be, it's going to be a, a process. Yeah, and his his pricing was crazy. It was out the wall. Yeah, well, he wants to put up a six foot fence around the entire property. Yeah, that and and he says he's going to do this all for four hundred thousand dollars, Fred. Well, maybe with the moat and the and the dragons, <laughs> who knows? So we'll see. With the, with the million dollar house for four hundred thousand. We'll see. <laughs> so there has been a new plan submitted to the township um, from Mr. Trello, and um, it's Edgewood Point. Um, we don't really, I mean, so James, for your information, um, the, the Historic Commission back in the, um, in the 1970s, late 1970s, uh, worked to establish what was called the Historic National Historic Register District of Edgewood to try to preserve the little crossroads at Edgewood Village. And we got it through, and then that required us to do some of the pre preliminary zoning and um, historic um, architecture review design plans. We had to work with an architect to get those through. And then we had to help create a HARB, an uh, Historic Architecture Review Board, that actually addresses buildings that are in that district. Um, 
So they have ultimate say over what the architecture looks like in the district. We have say over whether a building is historic or not. And in that, this particular point, this is the point where Langhorne Road and Edgewood Road come together. And the house at the point is, um, was built around 1790, because I found it on the 1790 tax uh, map by a man named John Dougherty. And he rented it on the 1798 tax list to the Free Negro Ishmael. And the Free Negro Ishmael, we, we're not sure, but we suspect that the Free Negro Ishmael is um, one of the Hicks, Gilbert Hicks's freed slaves that is now free. And he is listed on the, on the tax list as living in the house as a tailor in Edgewood Village. And he has, he's supporting a family with a wife and a daughter and several children. And um, so it, it, it implies that his clientele was white. It's just really interesting to see a free black man in Lower Makefield Township operating in the middle of the village, a tailor shop for basically white customers, which is really fascinating. Um, and that is why that house is significant. And we're gonna kind of fight to the last blow over that one. Next to it is a house um, that's just a little down from it. That is um, uh, from probably the mid 19, mid um, 20th century, um, no, the 19th century, probably around 1850, 1860, that was put up for the, the foreman of the Heacock nurseries that were basically across where Rose Hollow is. So the Heacock nurseries had gigantic cow barns that they took the manure out of the cow barns and they used the manure to fertilize roses. And the roses were sold all over the country, um, sort of like the moons have been doing since the century before. So um, Heacock started to do that. And by the time of the centennial in 1876, the Heacock nurseries were known all over the country as, as having the best roses ever. So the foreman lived in that house and it was called Carriage Crest. It actually had a name. Um, at some point it was converted to two units, um, probably in the mid 20th century. And that you can tell this from the basement when you go down, you can see evidence of how it's divided up and two, two units were made out of it. And um, up until about 15 years ago, it was rented by Cam Troilo to um, Danny Quill and his friends. He used to invite um, other veterans and people to live with him. And the other house at the point it was also two units at that point and was rented. Um, and Troilo had purchased it from another local landlord, a Flogie, who had been owned most of the houses in Edgewood Village before that. Most of those little houses have always been rental units by some wealthy person who has rented them out. So it's the lowest kind of rental unit in the township. Um, now it's on the register. So now it's protected. Um, and they have been practicing pretty much demolition by neglect for the last 20 years. So no one's living in either house. Um, they're boarded up, they're protected. Uh, the roofs are in various stages of decay. And once the roof goes, the house goes. So we're trying desperately to negotiate. Um, Cam Trulo Jr. has recently taken over operation of a lot of his father's properties. And he's come in with this new plan. Um, I'm not sure I can share it. I, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, let me see. I didn't really look at this to see if I could get it up. I know I have it on my computer. I don't have it in my Dropbox, sorry. Can't share it. Um, it is on this screen. I'll turn this. No. I don't know. Anybody see that? See it, but not read it. All right, so. So here's the point. This is the house. This is the house. Oh, we can't hear oh, you. It's hard to. Okay. <clears throat> 
it'll come up on the HARP meeting and you can look at it there. Um, the issue really is that he is finally saying he's going to preserve both buildings, which is a positive move. Um, however, the plan is, is really difficult because he is planning um, basically 12 rental units in two massive structures that parallel the driveway to the chapel. And then there's a pass through from Edgewood Road into a parking lot that only has approximately 12 spaces, 22 spaces um, for all of those people. And so that's parking for the entire 12 units plus two in the Danny Quill house plus a, a retail shop at the point he's, he's saying an ice cream center at the point. So 22 spaces considering um, the issues now with De Lorenzo's just seems like an incredible number of, of overdeveloped um, houses. Um, Harb's going to have their own say on it, but you know, feel free as a member of the historic commission to make your comment. We're, we're very happy that he's talking about saving both houses. And I don't mind two units in, in um, Danny Quill's old house. I think that would be fine. Um, as long as they don't change the window no openings and follow the National Register guidelines. I'm happy with that. And the same thing with the with the store. I hope they don't rip off sections, but we'll hopefully work with them about what can be saved and what what cannot. Uh, and possibly we could tweak it. We had hoped that when this was built, that there would be more actual buildings on the Langhorn Road and parking would be in the middle. So if maybe if they could tweak it and he could knock it down to eight units, not 12 units, it's a doable plan. Um, but it's certainly better than anything we've heard from him thus far. So I thought I'd let you know that when you, when you hear that being mentioned, that's going on. As we point, it's really um, obvious, as I said, the inadequate parking is the obvious thing that's going to hold it up. Um, and he's trying to jam too much in. But something positive, anything's positive than what we see there today. So. Um, I think that's good. And if everybody could make a comment to them that's that's positive, I think that would be good. If you want to call into that meeting, um, I'll send you the notice when my husband gets notice that that, that meeting's happening. Uh, all business. Okay, so the videos and informational contacts for the public. Um, yeah. So I put together these 45 slides, as I said, and I realized as I did it, that it really does need to be segregated into sections. Um, you know, I, I could basically do a lecture myself on it. And the way I do my slideshows, if you've ever seen one, is I tend to put up a show and then <clears throat> a slide and then talk about it because I, I hate I hate it as a student seeing slides with that I could read and have the person just reading the slides to me, you know, when I can read it myself. So I always um, kind of put up slides that are suggestive and then talk. So, um, so I could do an entire lecture just on the geography of Lower Mayfield Township and Lower Bucks County. And then a whole slideshow on Native Americans. And then a whole slideshow on the Dutch and the Swedish settlers. And then a whole slideshow on, on um, the, the Iroquois and Bonape around here and how they adjusted the land and trapped the beaver and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so I think it's going to be much bigger than I thought it's going to be, and maybe we need to look for some corporate sponsors and have you get more involved in actually doing some of this, because I think some of you are very capable and can certainly get into presenting some of this stuff rather than all me, <clears throat> the voices is steadily getting worse. So, you know, that's something that I really am would be happy to, to give over. Um, anybody would like to put some input. Go for it. So what is your vision for this when it gets done? Where does it, where does it exist that people can access it? Um, my thought is YouTube. I mean, I really think we need to create some okay. YouTube channels and because that's where the teachers are looking yeah, that's and point. that's right. what they're doing. Right. I mean, it's not difficult no. for us to be able to record, you know, videos or, and then put them onto YouTube. I mean, it's just a matter of, like you said, doing a little bit of uh, scripting in terms of what chapters we want to have and what we want to say to it. So, um, so I'll think of them as lesson plans. 
and right. put out you know, basically a lesson plan and then have a series that people can check into for stuff that they're interested in. And then if you have specific in interests, let me know. Um, I, I could see a whole video on trains. I could see a whole video on the, the commerce in Little Lakefield after the Civil War, you know, a whole video on, on uh, farming techniques. So, you know, we can ask Patterson Farm people to do that. Uh, uh, a whole video, you know, and then we all get to contribute to what, what, we, what we have as, as a product. And I think it would really help out at Pennsbury. I mean, what they have is horrible. Uh, did you look? Yes, I guess, I, and I didn't find the one that you had told us about. Um, but I guess the question is, is when you say we need corporate sponsors, we need money, but, but I'm wondering what do we need money for? Because with, you know, with Zoom and the right materials, we could just do this. Yeah, I mean, a PowerPoint wouldn't cost us, you know, we could do a PowerPoint presentation, it's not going to cost us anything, we could just right. upload that up to, to YouTube. I mean, you can record it right here on Zoom, right? Yeah. And, and then just upload the whole thing onto YouTube. Yeah, yeah. We just did that for one of our uh, for our seventh grade class. We did. I just took a book, and we just got done YouTubing. I think eighteen lessons on different points. Uh, but there, the only secret that I think we have is that if it's any longer than fifteen minutes, you lose them. Yeah. You know, so yeah, like, about fifteen minutes is the. the it would be better to have a lot of YouTubing with right. eight minutes, six minute sessions, just right. like con like what a Iroquois Indian is, boom, done. What this is, done. Because what it is, is the longer it is, the less likely they're going to stick by it. Yeah, I think 10 minutes probably should be the max. 10 minutes is the, yeah. And maybe maybe what we do is for the next meeting, we come back with ideas for whatever the, the different lesson plans would be, maybe come with 10 topics or five, okay, whatever. Well so could we, I mean, could we take Helen's 45 page deck and then just create like storyboard it out into various lessons plans? That's what I was thinking. That, that's a good idea. You know what? I'll send you what I did and you can see what I did um, <clears throat> and why it's too long and why it's too, no. you know, gets, gets way too into the weeds. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, and I'm happy to accept any criticism at all because because I know you know, it, it, it's, I'm very enthusiastic, but a lot of people are <laughs> by a bunch of the stuff that I talk about. So um, <clears throat> whatever you, whatever you can, wherever you can contribute, let me know. And wherever you see that there's like gaps, because I, after I did it, I was like, oh, why didn't I talk about that? Oh, why didn't I talk about that? Or, you know, and I could have, I just didn't do it on that. This was basically, I put three days into it. And, you know, then my husband was ready, like, what the hell are you doing? We just stop for a minute. What I'm thinking is, if we got a sponsor, every time we got a certain number of people looking at it, we would get, we would, we could possibly generate some yeah. income for the group. That's true. I mean, actually, there's ways to monetize things on YouTube. So, right. Yeah, I mean, right. Because we're not generating it sitting on Zoom, if you know what I mean. And we need, there's so many projects that we could actually be putting money into and trying to help the, the township out a bit. So do you, do you think a book company might be interested in something like that? I know yeah. we, I just got done picking up, a book company just got done helping out the diocese with generating YouTube retreats for the kids and uh, Zoom retreats and that, it, that it's basically the same way. So many hits, then they get, I don't mean- I can't percentage, imagine more, but they get something. Horrific, but anyway, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think it could be done. And I, I mean, I, I was so amazed at how generous Mr. McCaffrey was over the uh, plant, the program for the soldiers. So I, I think, there's a lot of, of people out there who would be really happy to sponsor for us to do something like that and and um, and, and generate some. As I said, I I I don't, despite what my husband says, I don't want any income from it. But I do want to help the township um, get as much as we can toward these projects. So is there a way to make? Do do we have some sort of online payment? option that you could ask people like at the end of the video to say if you're interested in donating to help preserve 
local history, check out this link and you can like donate five dollars or something. That would be awesome. Because I, I mean, I was looking at the um, I was looking at the uh, historical society's website, trying to figure out like how to become a member. Um, and uh, so first of all, it's it's a it's a it says to print it out, um, which you can't do right now. Um, and I'm not sure who I would be able to hand a form to on there. But second of all, there's no sort of online payment option. No. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if if that would be something that would be possible to get um, going. I, I don't know what our relationship is with the Lower Mayfield. Um, I'll of, explain. But... Uh, as, as a former, as a former <coughs> president of the Historic Society, right now the Historic Society is in limbo. Um, their, their president died um, at the beginning of last fall, was it? Yeah, it was just yeah. suddenly. And so last year they did nothing. Um, they had a couple of meetings about possibly joining with Yardley. And there, the issue is that there's a lot of money that came into the Historical Society from the township in donations of property that the Lower Mayfield Historical Society as a 501c3 was, was using to restore an old house. That they then, uh, when I was on the board, we all decided that we were fighting over this old house. It, it couldn't be improved. Um, we, if we could not make it into the meeting spot or museum that we wanted. And the neighbors were starting to complain. So we decided to sell it and put it back on the tax list. So we had saved the old house. It was completed through, through uh, national registered standards, but we, we could not move forward with it. So we sold it. And that money went into a bank account, which is sitting in the historical society. And unfortunately, they haven't been able to get any other project from the township or haven't become interested in any project for the township. So they are thinking of bas basically taking that money and folding it into Yardley, where it may very potentially disappear into the old library in Yardley. So there's some issues with the historical society and us. Um, the last meeting that I attended and basically said, please don't do this. Um, I didn't hear the results of that meeting, so I have no idea what has happened. And as a former member, lifetime member, I haven't been informed about what's happening. So at this point, I don't know what the next step would be unless we call ourselves or, or get together and form a new Lower Makefield Historical Society and basically take it over. But that's that's where that whole situation is and form another 501c3 for the township history. Um, we would have probably have some legal right to take that that property over if we can find enough people to join a new revamped historical society and start it over again. Um, it probably has to be done within the year or or that money will probably walk. So that's the situation with that, according to the lawyers that I've checked with. Um, all right, uh, so I, I just have Barbara title as well. New business. Someone needs to work on the application. Perry Warren at the cemetery ceremony said he announced, of course, that the historic society had done all the work. I mean, did you hear that, Barbara, when he said that? Um, we, we constantly, James, we constantly get confused with the historical society. So, you know, it's kind of like the bane of our existence. But the historical society is a private. 501c3 with people from the township. We are appointed by the by the board of supervisors and serve at their will. So oh, we get reappointed if they wish us to be reappointed and um, basically try to do our best for the, to inform them of local history, to look at plans that come in and to help residents educate them on local history. That's our main purpose. So um, going forward, um, you know, we would we would like to uh, um, apply for the state marker. Um, they have highways of history, and they have these markers that the state historic commission puts out. And the application is due by the end of December. So Perry Warren's office would submit it for us. He he said, "Oh, we'll be expediting it, etc." So that would be great if he would help us with that. And um, hopefully we can do that. Does anybody particularly want to work on that application? I'll work on that application. You'll do it, Joe? Yes. Okay.
Hey, I'll send you the paperwork. Yeah, come with the link. Send it over. Go ahead. Now I was going to say, how how long is the application? Um, I I filled it in last year, and then we ended up not submitting it. Um, I think it's like three or four pages. Yeah. It's just you know name and place and why it's significant, and right. that stuff is could all be the same. Um, right. You just have to get letters from um, Warren's office, Fitzpatrick. You know that it requires like uh, chopping around. Um, I, I give you a letter, um, it, you know, for the significance, we could probably get a letter from Jeff Marshall for the significance of, a, of it as a marker. And the state apparently, Perry's getting them to pay for it because it's about $1,000 for one of these markers for the group that submits it. So that would be awesome if he gets the funding to pay for that. Okay. Is Joan, that okay, if you need any help, I'll help. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Is that okay, Fred? Do you think that's a good idea? Fred, on mute. It's okay with me. Okay, you can <laughs> announce that, I guess, is something that we're looking into that we're definitely doing. Um, so no business. Any, any new reports from you guys? Do you have anything to let us know? If you noticed any structures falling down or things that we need to tell the supervisors about? Nothing for me, but I did notice um, the uh, the old ferry house on River Road. It looks like they're starting to clear out some of the brush. I don't know if you had a chance to no. drive by there. Yeah, I saw it over the weekend. Where's that? At? So they're working on it again. That would be awesome. At least, at least the property. I don't. I don't know about the structure. Uh, Where's the old ferry house, Eric? It's uh, on River Road. It's um, if you're coming up from uh, Morrisville, it's on the on the left hand side. I think it's a little bit before Black Rock. Yes. Yeah. And I think that was Helen might have mentioned that I think a while ago that it actually was the original Yardley Ferry House. Or no, tavern. It, it's past Black Rock. <clears throat> it's between <laughs> Black Rock. In fact, it's past Manor Lane. It's it's before you get to Macclesfield. Okay. Right. Yeah. And before you get to Scatter Good Court. So it's right, it's on the left. Um, it's sort of right at the end of the island. Right. It's a double house or it's two front doors? Yeah, it, well, the oldest section is the most southerly section. Yeah. That was probably 1754. Right. And then the middle section, which is a three bay, has beautiful coins over the windows, um, cut stone coins. Um, that was Thomas Yardley's section. He bought it um, as an operating ferry tavern right. from John Doble. So Yardley, that was the edge of Yardley's grant. So right where the Tongue Cleef line kind of goes back through Macclesfield was the edge of what Thomas Yardley owned up until 1760. <clears throat> so his ferry was above it. This was the tavern at the ferry. Right. So you wow. came down Black Rock Road and you came up to the ferry mm -hmm. um, and that you stayed at that tavern. Now in 1800, he moved the ferry further north up to where the Swan is or to the the Yardley Inn, yeah. and then Landrick Manor, that became the Ferry Tavern because the, uh, this house was sold to the Anderson family. Okay. Who owns it now? Yeah, it's cool stuff. It's just, you know, the Ferry Taverns and who had the ferry licenses at the different points in time, and the Yardley ta um, Tavern, he, he held the tavern license for a while, but um, the Do John Doble actually ran the tavern and Yardley ran the ferry. So they're two separate licenses. And then he combined them when he bought that property, which was really cool. And then he put an addition on it and ran it. And until about 1798, he sold it to Andersons. Okay. Who, owned, who owned that White House up by the Slate Hill Cemetery? Joshua Anderson? He sold it to him. Okay. <clears throat> so that land, it, it goes directly up from that house. In fact, the edge of that that tavern probably is an edge of an old road. It went right up beside the cemetery to the Yardley Road. And the Oxford Valley Schoolhouse would have been right in front of it, across the, the uh, Falls Road. So the old Oxford Valley Schoolhouse is part of the um, veterans, um, the AFW, the back wing of it, you can see is an old stone structure. It's probably the old schoolhouse. It's just one what of those- What is the old house now? Um, it was for sale two years ago. Years ago, it's in Yardley Borough. 
uh, was for sale for like 490 and it's on four acres in Yardley Barrow. And it has like uh, four units. It's got a barn behind it that's a that's got two apartments in it. But it, it's um, it's not well kept. It's it's kind of like decorated in 1950s, frozen in time. Mm -hmm. If you know what I mean. It, it's it's not it's it's not old, you know. In terms of it's, it was modernized a la uh, House Beautiful's 1950. So it would require a lot work to either restore it to an old house or bring it up to a modern house. It's, it's at that awkward point in its history right now. But it's called Landrick Manor. Okay. Yes, I know where that is. Yeah. So James, do you have anything for us about what you, what, where you see yourself in? And you're obviously younger than all of us and hopefully you're going to encourage more young people to join in, in history of Lower Makefield. Yeah, I, I'd love to. Um, I guess some of the things that uh, I'm thinking about is uh, a bit more of the technical things, um, things like uh, like response forms online, being able to create things like, uh, I'll look into what options there are for online payment systems for something like that. Not exactly sure. Um, since you mentioned that the historical uh, society is 501c, not really sure how we like what where our money goes and who how how we solicit donations. Um, you said that there's a, a fund that um, we got from selling tours of the the graveyard. Um, where does that money go? What does it kind of what does it do? Yeah, <clears throat> that's an issue because we are basically a commission of the township and we cannot keep too much in funds. I you know, I don't know where this is going This is under Kurt um, and how he wants to handle it. This is one of the reasons I wanted to have a meeting with him <clears throat> last year to kind of figure this out. Before, under Terry and under Jinx Dillon, um, he wouldn't allow us to have anything other than an operating budget from the township. And um, we had to donate to the 501c3. So a lot of our funds and a lot of our work if we did a brochure or something, we, we got funds from the supervisors to print a brochure, but they either had to be given out for free or um, for a minimal amount to recoup, recoup our printing costs at the township. Um, when Ralph Thompson did the map, he used a lot of commission materials and commission time and commission effort to do the research, to do the, the maps of 1798 and the, um, the maps of the original purchasers for Lower Makefield, and he copyrighted it, and he was selling those maps. Um, but he made it a fundraising project of the local historical society. So basically, the money went into the historical society, and we had sort of a symbiotic relationship where, when we wanted to do something, we would ask them to help contribute to our, like we wanted to have an open house, or we wanted to invite community people in then they could put funds that we had pretty much generated for them into our projects. Um, after Pat died, that's, that has kind of gone away. So we're no longer um, finessing that the way that we used to. Um, at one point, this commission actually was put in charge of the renovations for one of the township properties, which was the Tomlinson store. <clears throat> and we got the fundings through the state from the State Historic Preservation Office to, to restore that whole building using National Register standards. We had to get grants from the PHMC to do it. We went for fundraising. The Historical Society helped with the fundraising for that. So that whole building got done pretty much as a joint partnership agreement between the Historical Society and the Commission. And that meant that the supervisors didn't have to be so... Um, embroiled in daily affairs of like what color paint we're using or which way we're putting that doorway up or all that, that kind of stuff. Um, and and the, the, the uh, property got renovated. Unfortunately then, <clears throat> when we couldn't find an adequate use for it and a way to um, utilize it, the township decided to sell it, which they did. And we had taken money from the state to restore it for public use and then it was sold to Bob Sill, um, which was, you know, I don't know how 
this, our relationship with the state over the years, they have changed personnel. Nobody's going to remember that stuff now. But, you know, some things have happened over the past that I don't know, you know, what kind of relationship Kurt sees that we would have for fundraising, for participating with the township. And I would hope they would use us as a, as, as a wing, as a fundraising um, branch and actually encourage more 501c3s to participate, maybe with us as the buffer so that they don't have to have so much participation with the actual day-to-day -day of, of a historic um, thing. Well, I don't know how you see it, Brad. Do, do you have any ideas for how that would work today? I have no idea. <laughs> the, the um, you know, and this is my own observation of the evolution of the township in the last few years. Um, I think as, as the financial condition of the township strengthens, we're going to be relying on the township staff, professionals to, um, to we're gonna, you know, the, the, the supervisors will figure out the priorities, the staff will, will make it happen and, and volunteers will, will serve as extra ears uh, to the community. But as far as fundraising is concerned, grant writing, I don't think that's going to be, except in maybe some limited cases, will be uh, left to volunteer committees. And I, and I say that for, only because I've seen the past and the potential conflicts of, of some volunteer or organizations with the will of the people of the township. So um, it'll be interesting to see how things evolve. But um, I think right now we're in a transition. I think in the next two or three years, uh, uh, things will be more clear to all of us. But um, I think at the, at, at the most, at right now for the, you know, for the Star Commission, what the board would like is that um, we continue to fight for what we still have and, um, you know, try to maintain it, you know, keep it, keep it in the, at the forefront of the, the minds of the residents of the township. If I right. could add something, I think one of the, the uh, confusions that I had when I, how I got on this board and not the historical society was the names are so similar and the delineation of the responsibilities are not really published, so to speak. And what happens is uh, thinking that I was becoming a member of Pat's group, the Historical Society, and then I got a phone call from somebody saying the meeting was this day, which turned out to be the Historical Commission, and I showed up here rather than there. That's how I got here, which I'm happy. But I'm saying that's how I got here. I didn't even know there was two groups in the township. So that's number one, like, you know, uh, if looking forward or moving forward, maybe the names need to be changed a little bit, even if it has to be uh, Makefield Historical Commission, you know, something has to be added or subtracted or whatever. That's just my observation. Well, if it's, if it's, if it's the consensus of the, of the Historic Commission to change the name, we can do that. You just ask, you just tell me and I will bring it up before the board. Is I don't that, know, if is we that, want to change our name or have somebody else change their name. We I mean, need to make I, them I, change their name, Barbara. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. I think we should name. change. Yeah, that's how I'm thinking, you know, but because if it's a commission for the township, it's already like not in stone, but it's it's formed by the township. Right. But it's that's where the confusion comes in. And that's why, like, maybe James. You're, yeah, you're 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 an auxiliary body of the Board of Supervisors. Exactly. You're an advisor. You, you advise the Board of Supervisors on the history of this township. And, so as I and, put it, we're the gophers. Yeah. yeah. So it's like good. an advisory board. I mean, I feel yes. like- You are exactly yeah. an advisory board. That's what it is. All, except, for the, except for the planning commission. Well, that's a, that's a recommendating board, but except for the zoning hearing board, the, the board of appeals and the HARB, um, which has, has, has actual authority, you know, limited authority over what its um, mandate is. 
every other committee is an advisory board, advisory committee to the board of supervisors, not to the township, to the board of supervisors. You give us some context so we can deliberate and make decisions for the best interest of the township. You know, the historic society can do whatever it wants. It's an independent company. Uh, you know, uh, Patterson Farm Preserve Patterson Farm uh, Preservation is a 50C3. They can do whatever they want. Um, uh, farmland Preservation, which is kind of a, a semi-committee, but they're a, they're a 501C3. They own property in the township and they maintain it. They could, you know, as far as their properties are concerned, it has nothing to do with the township. But you know, the historic commission. You know, they identified, they identified all the historic properties in the township and they advise us on how to proceed with those properties or with the general history of the township, you know, to preserve that history for succeeding generations. At least that's the way I look at it. I haven't seen an actual, uh, you know, the, the charter of the com commission which was formed years ago. So would you say that the topics we discussed tonight are in line with those responsibilities? Oh, sure. You know, cause you're, it, you know, that's, this is, you know, this is what I, I, I write this all down. it will be in my report on Wednesday for, for what, you know, what I will report to the board, those things that should be become agenda items you know, we'll discuss and we'll put it on the agenda for deliberation. But, you know, the, 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 the long-term problems that the townships had over a lot of these historic structures, if they're all on private property. And, you know, is, and one of the reasons why we've never gotten a lot of success, and this is only my opinion, is that we've never been able to convince the property owner to either give up the property or um, convince them that preserving the property is in their best interest. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's nice that the, the Troilos are starting to come around and offering a way to keep those two buildings. Hey, it's only taken 30 years. Hey, you know something? It's better than taking a bulldozer down and knocking them. You're out. right. Yeah. So, so you know, we we have a we have a habit in Lower Makefield of saying we'll fight for everything and lose, but at least we can say we fought. Right. It might be time, you know, the definition of insanity is hitting your head against a brick wall time and again, thinking something else is going to happen other than the headache. So, so um, maybe it's time to talk with the developer. And say, let okay. This, if you want to, if you want to keep, you know, thanks for let, for think, considering keeping the two structures. But let's build instead of building twelve apartments, let's build eight. You know, um, so you know, Helen was on the right track, I think. And you know, we work with the Harb, and maybe we can make this happen. And the next year, we have a real plan to preserve those two structures. Right. Uh, so you know, and let's not be so intransigent that we end up losing everything because that's not what we want to do. So, so um, Helen, I think you're on the right track. And I think we work with, um, I think you know the, you, you have, a, you have a, a, a friendship with the chair of the HARP or one of the members of the HARP. So um, maybe you can convince him to, uh, to work with you and maybe we can get a real solution uh, on that property. I think he's he's very happy about that. He's he's he thinks it's it's very positive. Um, <clears throat> somehow I seem to have lost my video. Um, Fred, I my only comment is I hope that you are aware that we are really here to help support Kurt. He doesn't seem to be too anxious to deal with volunteers. I get that, but there are a lot of people on this this particular commission who have a lot of contacts with. With, with corporate entities who have a lot of contacts with um, historical, other historical societies. I'm sorry, Helen, uh, 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 can you start, who are you, who are you talking about? 
Well, there are people on this commission who have a lot of contacts that could help her. Um, now, I, I, okay. I, 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 I understand that the, the, the diversion, and forgive me for, I want, I want to redirect. The Historic Commission, like every other committee, is a committee of, for, is a, an advisory committee to the Board of Supervisors. Kurt Ferguson is the township manager and he takes direction from the Board of Supervisors. Yeah. You, you're the, 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 the talent on the committees, you know, we, the board appreciates every member of the Star Commission and every member of every other, but you need to work with the Board of Supervisors and Kurt will do whatever the Board of Supervisors tells him to do. So, so Kurt is only one man and has a million things on his plate. And, you know, Kurt can only do what the Board of Supervisors authorizes him to do. So I hear what you're saying. And I, you know, if I could snap my fingers and make everything perfect, I would. But we all know that's never going to happen. <laughs> Um, it, you know, did, you, you, you give the liaison what you would like to do. The Board of Supervisors will make the agreement. And then, trust me, Kurt will do whatever needs to be done. Okay. <clears throat> so when, when we, time comes um, for working on some of the properties that the township does own, I would hope that you would consult with us and we would be able of to help you. Of course. Okay, that, we that's, all that's all that. that I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's we'd, that's we'd be happy happy to do anything that you decide to do. We'd be happy to keep people off your back, whatever it is no, that it's, you it's not a, I, I ran for office so people would be on my back. That's not the issue. But the issue is, 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 is that we get the Board of Supervisors to agree on a process and then Kurt will do what the Board of Supervisors wants. He can't have a hundred committees in his ear. It's just impossible. No, the span, it, it, just, it exceeds the span of control. You know, you can't have a thousand people telling him what to do. He takes yeah, okay. direction from one board and that's that. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so, I, I gotta protect my manager. <laughs> okay. Um <clears throat> Um, next thing on the agenda is um, we usually have some kind of get together at, at the Christmas time um, if we don't have a, um, a meeting. Um, I, I know Sunshine Act and all that stuff, so we don't talk business, but it's a time to socialize and kind of catch up and see where people are and, and how we feel um, and, and what we can kind of tentatively look forward to in the new year. Um, the first meeting of the new year should be January 11th. As far as I can see, I'm going to try to urge that we get the 7.30 meeting on Monday, January 11th. Um, does this work for people, except Becky, obviously? Yeah, really so. Yeah. It works for me. Okay. It works for me better, too. Just the nighttime meeting is always better. Um, I'm, I'm turning into grandma school. I've got three of them all day. Oh, I thought college students were bad. Oh my God. Um, just try a second grader, a fourth grader, and a sixth grader. Shoot me now. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, so I, I, I'd be willing to, to um, offer our house. Uh, my husband will kill me, but we, we could definitely meet here. We have a huge great room. We can spread out and be six feet apart. and. Um, possibly just share some desserts some evening in December if anybody wants to put forward a time when you're possibly free what what looks good for you I guess the question is is that a good idea with what's going on right now with the spread of the virus I mean places seem to be closing down and strongly discouraging households from mixing you don't want to do that then Oh, I want to do it. There's no doubt about that, Helen. The question is, is it a good idea for us? Would, would you prefer, um, um, say, outdoors to meet somewhere? That would definitely help, yes. Okay. Or we could have a virtual Christmas eggnog. Uh, 
gathering. Yeah, I just problem. we just got word that the uh, Philadelphia schools and the Archdiocese schools are closing totally oh. on the virtual. They found out today. So uh, I agree with Joe, the mixing of- well, You've got your mother to protect. Yeah, no, 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 not me, her. but I'm just saying the mixing of say, you know, Fred and Joe and all of us together. And, and I do have, have kids here all day long. Yeah. And your mother- I have is, kids all day long too. So I'm like, I'm true. like the, like I'm healthy, but God knows what I'm bringing to people. If I go anywhere, I don't go anywhere. I just had a flight school close. Everybody had, everybody's in isolation because four people tested positive for COVID at the airport. Oh, that's horrible. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, well, if somebody wants to sponsor a Zoom meeting, um, that sounds like that'll work. Um, and does anyone have a Zoom that they think would sustain us all? I have, a, I have a Zoom account that would allow us to do that, yes. Okay. So, Joe, why don't we let you set it? It up and and we'll all agree to meet some evening around 7 30 that you set up okay you pick I'll, it i'll put some i'll put some times out there we'll get we'll, get out. we'll find the okay time. thank you joe okay we'll, we'll all we'll all raise a, raise a, a cocktail or something because i'd like to kind of get a chance to talk to you more especially james i'm so i'm so jealous i wanted to be an egyptologist oh when i went to penn i just oh <clears throat> so good for you. That's fabulous. Um, what period are you studying? Um, I'm actually a classics major as an undergrad, but I'm studying Roman Egypt. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, I actually started out in anthropology at Penn um, way back in 1969. Ah, so anyway, <laughs> a long time ago um, and, and got sidetracked, as you can tell. But, uh, you know, basically, um, it, my heart is still with the University of Louisiana. Um, Eric, any preference for you? I, I, I mean, I would meet in person, but certainly respect everyone's, you know, feelings and opinions. So Zoom meeting would be fine with me. Okay, Joe, well, we're going to rely on you and, and, and everyone else. We will meet again January 11th. Or we could come to the school and sit at a cafeteria table. They're like 12 feet apart. No. <laughs> you come here. I mean, we have plenty of space for eight people. Oh, you're in your office, aren't you? I mean, I didn't go home yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're still at St. John's? Oh, I'm Barbara. still at school. Oh, Barbara. It's been, it gets, gets to be zooey and zooier as the weeks go on. It's just un, unbelievable. Yeah, well, Max started back today was his first day back in Edgewood. Oh, well, poor kid. I think they're going to cut some down. But anyway. Um, Can I ask okay. a question on number four? I'm looking at just as we think through. I mean, I own number one's done. I own number two. Number three, I think, is divided among, you know, a couple things. I think, Helen, you're mostly following up on that. Um, number five, I will take on with Barbara. But number four, I guess we had two things we talked about there. One was, can we monetize? what's on YouTube and, and James, maybe if you're interested in looking, you, you could help us. With yeah, that. James is gonna look into that. Right, the other was, um, you know, uh, creating a lesson plan. So it, you, to take what Helen has, she'll distribute that, but kind of break it down into six to eight minute, you know, session sections that we could record. And I, again, I have a Facebook, I mean, sorry, I have a Zoom account, so I can help record them. That won't be a problem, but okay. who has that, who has to, who's gonna help to create that lesson plan and how to organize that? Yeah, I can help with that. Okay, well, I'll send the slides to, um, I'll send the slides to everybody, but okay. just so you have the, the PowerPoint present. It's a pretty big presentation. Um, so I'll send it from my Temple account. But, um, uh, I, you know, feel free to, to adjust however you wish. As I said, I looked at it afterwards and thought, oh, I wish I put that in there. I wish I, you know, had pulled that one. Um, and, and it was fascinating how much the kids really enjoyed it. I did tell them I was going to put it up, um, but I, I can't figure out how to do that. And I don't think that it's too long. And so, you know, I have to think of right. smaller things. Um, hopefully by the middle of next spring, because that's when they're really getting into the Pennsylvania history, according to the social studies books in fourth grade anyway. Um, I am still keep, I, uh, by the way, James, I'm, Pat and I were both in charge of the Lower Makefield Township history page on Facebook. So if anybody has anything that they wanna post on that, 
um, just send it to me and I'll, I'll put it up as a post to, for, for that. I try to, I've been trying to do it every week, but um, I'm falling down on that with <clears throat> the distractions from the Little East. Um, <clears throat> so um, whenever anybody wants to help out, please feel free. If you have some spare time, look stuff up on um, various databases, just search Laura Makefield in an old Trenton newspaper or old uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, look up octagonal schoolhouse i found the octagonal schoolhouse mentioned in a lot of the abolitionist society meetings all through eight from 1839 until 1850 um so that is so fascinating that that little octagonal schoolhouse after it ceased to be a schoolhouse became the site of the abolitionist meetings because the quaker meetings still owned it how the current owner got a hold of it is another part of that question barbara because i cannot find a deed that says they actually sold it to Mr. Weiner. So I think he just sort of acquired it by taking because it was on his property, which then puts a whole different issue on it. But I don't think we want to stir that beehive, um, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, I got, the, I got the feeling. I mean, he actually came out and almost said something like that. But I'm just saying, like, I think we need to know, get the facts. And, yeah. when, and when he took over the property, from what I understood, it was on his property, but it was not functional then. Like it yeah. was not a structure or anything. And I don't even know in my heart of hearts, when I talked to him about it, he sounded almost surprised that, that, we, that we still thought of it as a historical property, as an octagonal schoolhouse. So I don't think he's pulling my leg. I think he, his father knew a lot more about it yeah. than he did. I don't think his father shared too much of what you had said about taking it over and all. I don't think this gentleman knows that part of it. It's almost like a skeleton in the closet. And he got the feeling that his father purchased that prop, that part of it. So I don't know, like you said, I don't know anything about it. And I don't want to like close the door because like I, I know, said, before, I know. that's on my bucket list. Before I go, I want to make sure something is done because we're talking about it too many years. I know, I remember very distinctly a meeting with Ann Copenhaver and myself, and this was for the Historical Society, and she was president and I was one of the board members in the Historical Society, and we were called down to Sam Snipes' office in downtown Yardley, and Sam Snipes at that point was in his early 90s, I mean, he was doddering, and um, he took out from his safe the deeds to the octagonal schoolhouse, and he said, these are the deeds to the Octagonal Schoolhouse, and I'm donating it to the Historical Society. And he says, the guy that owns it doesn't really own it. We never sold it to him. It was given to me, and I was the last trustee, and here's the deeds. And he, he gave it to Ann Copenhaver, and she held the deed up, and he took a picture, and he said, thank you very much, and he took the deed back, and he put it into a safe. So, I don't know, um, <laughs> you know, whether this historical society owns it. I mean, there's all kinds of craziness. And I don't know who acquired Sam Snipes' records after he died either. He just died, what, last year? Just, yeah. <laughs> he was in his hundreds. I mean, he was ancient. Um, but what a character. Um, James, you're in for, for a fun ride. It's, it's a fun place to be. Well, maybe James could look into it with a set of new eyes. There you go. Do some deed searching. Cool. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you in January. We'll see you in December at our Zoom get together. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Stay safe. Bye.